About five years ago, my partner and I went on a trip to Wyoming. I don't know how she does it, but she managed to find an incredible camping spot. Whenever I try to plan a trip, I fail miserably, which is one of the many reasons I love her. She's always organized and helps keep me on track since I'm the most indecisive person I know. We could camp pretty much anywhere in the area, so I drove our car to the perfect spot and we started setting up our tent, grill, and music, along with everything else we needed to make it a great trip. We planned to stay for five nights, but we only made it through three. I'm sure anyone would have left after experiencing what we did on that third night. The first couple of days were amazing. Unlike many camping spots in the US, this part of the country felt different. Maybe it's just because I grew up on the East Coast, where I think of camping as being surrounded by trees, lakes, and the kind of settings you see in old slasher movies. Instead, this area was filled with mountains, sand, and a type of plant life I wasn't used to seeing. I fell in love with it right away and made sure to enjoy every moment. Probably the best part of the trip was that we hadn't seen a single person in three days. While some might find that eerie, for us it was perfect. Then came the third night. That day had been just as great as the others. We had hiked up some trails and were more tired than usual. So we took it easy that evening and got into our tent early. I think the last time I checked my phone, it was around 9 p.m. Not long after, we both fell asleep. I woke up several hours later to my wife shaking me. Worried, I asked what was wrong, and she raised a finger to her lips, telling me to stay quiet. She was pointing outside the tent. I stayed quiet but wasn't sure what I was supposed to be hearing. She eventually mouthed to me that she thought there was an animal outside. I chuckled a little, thinking it was cute that she was scared of some animal. In hindsight, that was dumb because there are plenty of dangerous animals in the area that could have easily hurt us if they wanted to. I started listening closely, and then I heard a growl. It was the strangest growl I'd ever heard. It wasn't deep or menacing like you'd expect from a bear. Instead, it sounded weak, like a creature attempting to growl but not quite getting it right. I wondered if it was a sick or dying animal. Then, I remembered an article I had read about rabid coyotes attacking people. The footsteps outside sounded light, like they were coming from something small, possibly a coyote. I didn't want to take any risks. When I heard the creature move away from the tent, I slowly unzipped the entrance and whispered to my wife to head to the truck. Once the zipper was down, we didn't see anything, so we quickly jogged over to the truck, jumped inside, and locked the doors. From there, we tried to spot whatever was making the noise. Minutes went by, but we saw no movement. Still, I knew something was out there. We had both clearly heard it. My wife started dozing off again, but this time I shook her awake, startled. What I saw was not an animal but a person, a very scruffy looking man with long, messy hair and a beard. He was hunched over and making the growling noises we had heard earlier. Anger welled up inside me, and I was ready to confront him, but then things got worse. Just beyond our campsite, three more men appeared. They seemed to be whispering and chuckling among themselves. Three of them were carrying large sticks, or at least that's what I thought they were. Suddenly, one of the men lifted his stick high above his head and slammed it down on our tent. I heard one of them shout, and it made me think they hadn't realized we weren't inside. My fight or flight response kicked in immediately. I started the truck and drove off as fast as I could, leaving our tent and all our things behind. I didn't even glance back at the men's faces. I just wanted to get as far away as possible. As we drove, my wife waited until we had cell service, then called the police to report what had happened. I think they connected her with a park ranger or someone like that because she got a few follow-up calls from law enforcement. We never went back for our tent or belongings, and the park ended up charging me a fee for leaving my stuff behind and cutting our reservation short. The officers were understanding, but the park's management didn't care about what we'd gone through and insisted on charging us. In the end, it was a small price to pay for getting out unharmed. 
I just hope those guys were caught and that no one else had to go through what we did. Many people dislike the city, but I would choose city life over the wilderness any day, especially after what happened to me and my friends about a year ago. One of my friends had recently split from her fiancé of seven years, and she was having a tough time. Of course, I couldn't blame her. Our other friend, who loves the outdoors, suggested we all go camping for a night to cheer her up. Surprisingly, she agreed to the idea. So. The three of us found a small cabin in the woods to stay for the night. I was looking forward to spending time with my friends, away from the city and all the dressing up and nightlife. However, as I expected, my recently separated friend quickly got bored. She started searching for nearby bars and found a little dive bar in the nearest town. I joked that this was my idea of camping, heading to a bar instead of staying out in the wild. It was still a fun change of scenery. The bar was quiet, mostly filled with locals, and we didn't have to deal with the usual city crowd. My friend started chatting with one of the guys at the bar. He was older but had a rugged, handsome look. Whether it was the alcohol or just her emotions from the breakup, she was flirting a lot with him. This went on for some time, but eventually, she broke off from the conversation and told us she was ready to head back to the cabin. On our way back, we teased her about the guy, and she laughed it off, saying it was no big deal. When we got back to the cabin, we had one glass of wine before deciding to call it a night. It was clear by now that camping wasn't our thing. Being in a small cabin with no Wi-Fi and little to do wasn't as fun as we thought it would be. We decided to sleep in the living room together, one on the couch, one on the love seat, and one in the recliner. We all quickly fell asleep. A little after 3 a.m., I was woken up by one of my friends, who looked really worried. She said she heard the doorknob rattling. I laughed and told her she was just imagining it, but then I heard it too. It wasn't just a small shake. Someone outside was trying hard to get in. We were too scared to move, so we huddled together on the couch, holding the blanket over us. The cabin was small and you could easily walk around the entire thing in just a minute or two. To our horror, we heard footsteps outside circling the cabin. Whoever it was, they were trying to be sneaky, but we could hear each twig snapping with every step. They made their way to the back of the cabin, right behind the couch we were lying on. There was a large window there, and we heard someone trying to open it. For some reason, I yelled, I'm calling the police. The sound stopped for a second, and then we heard a whisper from outside. It was a man's voice, and he was whispering my friend's name, the same friend who had been flirting with that guy at the bar. My mind instantly thought of him, but I couldn't believe he had followed us here. I pulled back the curtain, and there he was, standing like a deer caught in headlights. It was indeed the guy from the bar. He raised his hands defensively, like he was the one in trouble and then ran off. I didn't see him get into a car or anything. He just took off into the woods. We called the police right away and reported what could have been a break-in. I'm not sure what came of it since we left early that morning, not long after the police arrived. It wasn't until we were driving home that everything really started sinking in and we realized just how terrifying the situation was. We had returned to the cabin before midnight and this guy didn't try to break in until after 3 a.m. That means he must have followed us, watched us for hours, waited for us to fall asleep, and then tried to get in. The thought of him lurking outside all that time still makes me sick. I'm so grateful my friend woke up when she heard the door because if she hadn't, I don't know what would have happened. Later, we found out that the window had been unlocked, and it would have been only a matter of time before he got inside. In a strange way, this experience helped my friend. She was so thankful to come out of it unharmed that it put her life into perspective, helping her begin the healing process after her breakup.
A strange incident happened to me a few years back when my girlfriend, now wife, and I decided to go on a last minute camping trip. I wasn't much of a camper, only having gone a few times with a buddy, but she had camped frequently with her family when she was younger and was eager to go again. She thought it would be a great way for us to escape the city noise where we lived and spend quality time together. She went all out and bought a bunch of cool camping gear, including a new, roomy tent. I liked that it was bigger, especially since I'm a bit larger myself. One feature I really liked about the tent, which I later learned most tents have, was a small window that allowed us to see outside. Even though I knew it would be dark, the idea of seeing out and having the morning light come in was comforting. We arrived at the remote campsite in the afternoon, planning to stay two nights. That first afternoon, we didn't do much, just set up the tent, relaxed, and went to bed early. I loved the window in the tent, and as I lay in my sleeping bag, I stared out at the beautiful night sky. As expected, the sunlight streamed through the window the next morning, and it felt like waking up in my own bed. We got up early and made the most of the day by fishing, hiking, and lounging around, reading and soaking up the sun. By evening, we were ready for another early night, which was fine with us. We weren't exactly night owls, and we were worn out from the day's activities. As we settled in for the night, I propped the window open again. While I was drifting off, I thought I saw something move outside the tent. At first, I wasn't sure if I had just nodded off for a second or if I really saw something. Before I could figure it out, my girlfriend asked, Did you see that too? I told her I thought I had. We both sat up and peered out the small tent window. Everything seemed calm. Then, suddenly, my girlfriend gasped, as if all the air had been sucked out of her. I turned to see what had startled her. About 30 or 40 feet away, perched on a tree branch, was a person. They were wearing a creepy, fake mask of some famous figure and swinging their feet back and forth, like a child on a swing. We were frozen with fear. We hadn't seen a single person the entire time we'd been camping, and now, out of nowhere, there was this masked person so close to us. My heart pounded, and though I wanted to cry, I held it together for my girlfriend who was already in tears. The person wasn't doing anything directly to us, but their presence was deeply unsettling. We watched them sit in that tree for about five minutes, which felt like an eternity. Then they jumped down. The individual didn't come closer to the tent, but the sense that they might charge at us any second wouldn't go away. After pacing around for what felt like hours, the person stopped. They stood there motionless, for what seemed like forever. Then, they turned to face the tent, and we heard muffled laughter coming from under the mask. The person began waving, not a small wave, but an exaggerated, wild motion, like they were trying to shake something loose from their arm. Suddenly, they stopped waving, and in a barely audible voice from under the mask, we heard them yell, bye, guys. Then, without warning, they sprinted off into the woods at full speed. We sat there, stunned, staring out of the window all night. We may have dozed off here and there, but for the most part, we stayed awake. The person never returned, and in the morning, there was no sign of where they had come from or where they had gone. The most disturbing part was that this person clearly knew we were there. We had no idea how long they'd been sitting in that tree, maybe minutes, maybe hours. All things considered, we were lucky since nothing physically happened to us, but the experience left us shaken. Even now, it still creeps us out when we think about it. Since that night, we've gone camping several times, but we always stay in a cabin with locked doors. It's hard to believe that this event happened over a decade ago. Time really does slip by if you're not paying attention. This experience was one of the strangest and most terrifying things I've ever been through. At the time, I had just started dating my girlfriend, and because of our busy schedules, we hardly ever saw each other. 
I was in my early 20s back then, and I really just wanted some alone time with her. But that opportunity never seemed to come. We were both still living with our parents, so finding private moments was difficult. We hadn't been together long, but I was already getting frustrated. Felt like she always had plans, and I was just an afterthought. One weekend, I expressed how I felt, and she told me that she had already made plans for a camping trip with her friends and couldn't hang out. I was livid and on the verge of ending things before they had a chance to really begin. That same day, she left for the trip but later texted me, saying her friends had agreed I could come if I wanted. I'm not a fan of camping, but I wasn't going to pass up a chance to be with her. The campsite was only about 40 minutes away, so I packed up and headed out. When I arrived, it wasn't what I expected. The site wasn't deep in the woods, but more like a big open area with lots of other people around. Felt crowded, and not at all like the camping I imagined. Nonetheless, I finally met all her friends, and they were fun, loud, and outgoing. Completely different from my girlfriend, who was much quieter and reserved. As the evening went on, I noticed there were plenty of trails nearby, and I decided to take a walk. As I wandered down the paths, I started to get a real sense of how expansive the area was, and for the first time, it felt like proper camping. Later that night, we grilled some food and played card games as the sun went down. We even had a few drinks, though we had to hide our beers since alcohol wasn't technically allowed. Around 11 p.m., two people, who I assumed were rangers, came over to our area. They shined their flashlights at us and asked why we were still awake. We all laughed, confused by the question. One of the guys in our group responded sarcastically, saying, why wouldn't we be? We're on vacation and just hanging out. One of the rangers immediately snapped back, saying there was a strict 10 p.m. curfew and all lights had to be out. We thought it was a joke, but the ranger wasn't playing. My girlfriend's friend, who had spoken before, replied with frustration, saying she paid good money for the site and didn't intend to go to sleep early. The ranger wasn't having it and basically scolded us like kids. They warned us that if we didn't follow the rules, we'd be kicked out. Feeling irritated, we all retreated to our tents. One of the group suggested we quietly meet up in a tent to continue playing cards. However, the ranger overheard this and immediately came back, sternly telling us that lights out meant no more cards, no more talking. It was time for bed. They warned that if they caught us awake again, we'd be out. Feeling like kids being disciplined, we grumbled but complied. Since we had been drinking, we didn't want to risk getting kicked out, especially because no one was in any shape to drive. Eventually, most people dozed off, but my girlfriend and I stayed awake, enjoying the rare alone time. She then suggested something surprising, sneaking off onto one of the trails to really get some privacy. Being in my early 20s, I was all for it. We quietly slipped out of the tent and made our way to one of the nearby paths. After walking far enough to feel alone, we started to enjoy our time together. But that moment was cut short when we heard a loud, hey, from behind us. We froze, trying not to make any noise, thinking it might be one of the rangers. Then we heard the voice again, I know you're there, I just want to say hi. We looked at each other, confused. What did that even mean? I peeked around a tree and, even though it was nearly pitch black, I could see a strange looking man standing on the trail with a small flashlight. He was short and wearing a baggy white shirt. As soon as he saw me, he smiled and said, hey buddy, I've got something for you. The situation felt off and I immediately felt a knot of tension in my gut. I didn't say anything, unsure how to respond. Then the man said something that made no sense. I've got a bunch of money on me and my ex-wife's going to take it. I want to give it away before she finds out. Why don't you come over here and take it? He stretched out his hand, though there was nothing in it and stood about 20 feet away. I looked at my girlfriend and mouthed, run. The second she took off, I followed. As I started running, 
I glanced back and saw the man lunge toward us, yelling something like, no, but we were already sprinting, putting distance between us and him. We made it back to the campsite without looking back. After about an hour, the rangers came around for another check, and I flagged down the same woman who had yelled at us earlier. I told her about the man I saw, though I lied and said I had spotted him from the tent. She believed me and called the authorities. That was the last I saw of the creepy guy. For the rest of the night, I kept my eyes fixed on the trails, half expecting to see him again, but thankfully he never reappeared. To this day, I have no idea what his true intentions were, but the look in his eyes when we ran is something I'll never forget. Every year, when camping season rolls around, I think back to that night and feel grateful that we managed to get away safely. There's a reason I always hesitate when people suggest camping. It's not that I hate nature or the outdoors. I just prefer sleeping in a comfortable bed instead of on the ground in a tent. But this one year, my boyfriend convinced me to go camping with the promise that we'd stay in a cabin so I could have that bed. I still pushed for the beach, but at least I wouldn't be roughing it in a tent. The trip was planned with two other couples, making six of us in total. We found a cozy, mostly secluded cabin in the woods, just a short walk from a picturesque lake perfect for swimming. Though I wouldn't admit it, I was starting to warm up to the idea once we arrived. The first day was incredible. We spent the entire day hiking trails, swimming in the lake, and grilling steaks in the evening. The day ended with us heading to bed around midnight. I didn't sleep well, though. I kept hearing noises outside all night, but I convinced myself it was just my imagination. After all, we were deep in the woods, and strange sounds aren't exactly unexpected. The next morning, as we were preparing for a hike, we were greeted by a cheerful voice from behind. Hey there, how's it going today? My boyfriend, ever the social one, immediately started chatting with the man. He introduced himself as Wade and claimed to know all the trails around the area. The interaction was a bit odd, but nothing too alarming. He mentioned he lived nearby and had heard us, so he wanted to check in and make sure we were settling in fine. It felt nice that someone would do that, though his sudden appearance was a little strange. Wade was a big guy, easily over six feet tall with a bit of a belly. He had a backpack, hiking boots, and jeans, looking like any regular local enjoying the trails. After some friendly talk, he laughed in a booming voice and went on his way. We joked about Wade for a bit as we hiked, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Later that afternoon, we headed back to the lake to swim. While we were lounging on the dock, soaking up the sun, we suddenly heard that same voice again. There you all are. We jumped, startled. Standing at the edge of the dock was Wade, once again. We asked him what he was doing, and he claimed he was just passing by. My boyfriend shrugged it off, chatting with him a little more, but one of my friends and I were feeling uneasy. Wade just kept laughing and looking around. After some small talk, he wandered off, mumbling to himself. That night, as we gathered around the campfire sharing spooky stories, I felt increasingly uncomfortable. Out of nowhere, Wade suddenly burst from the bushes, yelling, here I am, followed by his usual loud laughter. We all nearly jumped out of our skin. My boyfriend, now irritated, told Wade off, saying scaring us like that wasn't cool and that he should just leave us alone. Wade seemed upset, insisting he was just trying to make our trip memorable. He eventually left, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right, especially since it was so late at night. The incident soured the mood, and we soon decided to call it a night. As we cleaned up the cabin, I confessed to my boyfriend that I had a bad feeling about Wade. I couldn't help but think the noises I'd heard the previous night might have been him lurking around. That night, I struggled to fall asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, 
I heard footsteps and heavy breathing outside our window. I shook my boyfriend awake, begging him to check. He groggily got up but quickly turned pale. He whispered to me that someone was pacing outside, and he was sure it was Wade. I peeked out and saw Wade muttering to himself and pacing back and forth. He tried the door handle, but it was locked. Frustrated, he started hitting his own head before eventually walking off into the woods. We were terrified and didn't know what to do. My boyfriend called the cabin's owner and the police. When the officer arrived, we explained the whole situation, but he didn't seem too concerned, just nodding along as we spoke. Felt like he wasn't taking us seriously. We packed up our things and stayed awake until dawn. As soon as the sun rose, we loaded up the van and left. As we were driving down the main road, we spotted Wade walking alone, still talking to himself and occasionally hitting his head. We informed the police dispatcher, but I never found out if they caught up with him or if he just disappeared back into the woods. I'm just grateful we got out unharmed. From now on, though, I'm done with camping. Everyone else can go without me. So, I'm finally putting this down, just hours after the wildest experience of my life. I know it might sound a bit exaggerated, but at the moment, it truly felt unreal. My family and I had just arrived at our campsite for the week, and I'm still on edge, glancing over my shoulder every few minutes, even though deep down I think everything's fine. I'll do my best to retell it, as this is my first time recalling it since it all happened. Late last night, my family and I left home to start our week-long camping trip. Our two kids were beyond excited to join us for the first time on one of our outdoor adventures. My spouse and I have been camping for years, but we waited until our kids were old enough to handle it. Finally, the time had come for them to join us. We set out on a six-hour drive, a little after 11 p.m. After the initial excitement and the mini-concert in our vehicle, Everyone eventually drifted off to sleep. Everyone except me, of course. That gave me some quiet time to listen to an audiobook I hadn't had the chance to get into for a while. I was surprised to find that we were almost at our destination, and my family had slept through most of the drive. They woke up here and there, asking where we were, but for the most part, they stayed knocked out. Then, about 25 minutes from our campsite, I hit a dreaded flat tire something no driver wants, especially on a vacation. Luckily, I had a spare, so this was more of an inconvenience than anything, though I was still frustrated. I remember feeling a bit shaken as I briefly lost control of the car, sliding to the shoulder of the road before regaining it. Despite the commotion, my family remained asleep. Quietly, I stepped out, moved some bags to access the spare tire, and began to change it. As I worked, I started wondering what caused the flat since it seemed to happen out of nowhere. Felt odd, almost suspicious. I had just finished swapping the tire when I heard a soft throat clear, like someone was trying to get my attention. I turned around, expecting to see my spouse, but instead, there was a petite woman standing there, her hair in wild braids and a tattoo of a flower on her neck. Hey! She greeted me in a calm, almost sweet voice. I'm Anna. Looks like you could use a hand. Caught off guard, I responded politely but nervously. Uh, thanks, but I think I've got it. She gave me a smile, but something felt off. She kept glancing toward the side of the road like she was signaling to someone. Each time I looked, though, there was nothing. She continued offering to help, her voice staying polite, but I kept refusing. I was polite at first, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. As I packed up my tools and prepared to leave, she suddenly changed her tone. Her voice turned sharp, almost aggressive. I really think you need my help. No, I don't, I replied firmly, feeling my patience were thin. Look, I've got a family in the car and I'm not dealing with this right now. You need to leave, or I'm calling the cops. 
Instead of backing off, she started laughing. At this point, I had had enough. I turned to get in the truck, putting the keys where I could quickly start the engine. But as I turned back to grab my wrench, she was mid-swing, aiming right at my head. I managed to catch the blow in time and kicked her in the leg, knocking her off balance. She grunted, then scrambled away toward the direction she had been eyeing earlier. Without wasting another second, I jumped into the truck and sped off. I checked the mirrors constantly, looking for any sign of her or a car following us, but the rest of the drive went smoothly, thank goodness. When my spouse woke up, I told them what happened. They were furious that I didn't call the police right away, but they also didn't entirely believe me. Once we got to the campsite, they made the call and gave the police a full description of the woman, her name, the tattoo, and the road where she appeared. Now, I can't shake the feeling that she's going to find us. She clearly saw the camping gear in the truck and knew where we were headed. And though I have no solid proof, I can't help but think she had something to do with the flat tire. I'm trying to enjoy the rest of our trip, but I wanted to get this story down while the details were still fresh in my mind. I can't stop wondering what her plan was. Did she want to steal the truck? Rob me? Or was it something worse? Wish me luck. If anything new happens or the police give us any updates, I'll be sure to share. But for now, I hope I never see Anna with that flower tattoo ever again. The story took place about 14 years ago when my parents let me have two of my best friends over for a sleepover. They set up a tent in the backyard for us to camp out. My mom stocked up on snacks, and my dad ordered pizza and drinks before heading out for dinner. We were so excited to be out in the tent, dragging as much food as we could outside and starting to eat while chatting. We went over our plans for the night, scary stories, esmores, and whatever else came to mind. After eating as much pizza as we could, we started talking about our crushes and whether we'd have the courage to ask them to dance when school started the next year. At one point, we tried setting up a blanket and pillow fort inside the tent, but we failed miserably. All the while, I had this strange feeling like I could hear something outside the tent. I unzipped the window screen to look outside, but I didn't see anything. A few minutes later, my friend mentioned hearing something too, like something brushing against the tent. My other friend, Audrey, peeked out the window and suddenly said, Do you see that black thing over there? I looked and saw something that looked like a white Nike symbol flash by. I couldn't help but scream, and then both of my friends started screaming too. We bolted for the house and ran straight into the bathroom, locking ourselves in. We tried to stay as quiet as possible, but then we heard footsteps, and the bathroom door handle started to jiggle. We all screamed at the top of our lungs, and Audrey was frantically calling the police. Just then, I heard my mom's voice saying we could come out. Slowly, we opened the door, and there were my parents, standing there with smiles. My dad apologized and took the phone from Audrey, explaining to the dispatcher, Sorry, this is her father. I was just playing a prank on the girls during their sleepover. Looking back now, I'm surprised the cops didn't show up, but it's a small town and my dad probably knew the officers. Though we were upset at first, we got over it pretty quickly since my dad was always playing jokes. He helped us with the fire for our esmores, put on some music, and kept asking if we needed anything from the store, probably feeling guilty for scaring us so badly. Eventually, we got tired and headed back to the tent to sleep. I remember staying up the longest, wanting to make sure my friends were comfortable before I dozed off. But later, I woke up to pitch black darkness and the sound of crickets. At first, I thought I heard something, but I figured it was just a dream. As I was trying to fall back asleep, I noticed one of my friends was snoring really loudly, and it seemed to get even louder. Curious, I sat up to see which friend was making the noise. That's when I was eye level with the tent's window screen and had a flashback to earlier. Something moved outside the tent, 
and suddenly, I heard the zipper of the tent door opening. I yelled, Dad, stop it. Enough with the pranks. My friends won't want to come over again. But there was no response, and my friends started to wake up. Frustrated, I said again, Dad, leave us alone, please. And then I heard a voice, not my dad's, but a much deeper one say, How do you know it's me? I froze. All I could think to do was grab my friends and drag them out of the tent. We ran inside without saying a word, my friends more confused than scared. I went straight to my parents' room and told my dad what had happened. He jumped out of bed immediately and went outside. I could hear him shouting something before coming back in to call the police. My mom stayed with us while my dad waited outside. Soon, police lights flashed outside and my dad spoke with the officers for about 20 minutes. When he came back, he told us that someone had been causing trouble in the neighborhood. But luckily, they caught the guy and we were safe. My dad apologized for scaring us earlier and said he was relieved we were okay. He asked if my friends wanted to call their parents or go home. Audrey was fine and wanted to stay, but my other friend, May, called her mom and went home. Audrey and I decided to move our little camping adventure to the living room, and my dad helped us build a pillow and blanket fort. There were only a few hours until morning, and we eventually got up for breakfast. My parents asked if we wanted a pool day, and it was exactly what we needed to get our minds off the night before. Audrey and I are still friends to this day, and I don't think either of us has been camping since then.